For Krima Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamenim. Joining me today to discuss a book titled Standing Up for Science, A Voice of Reason is our own professor, clinical infectious diseases epidemiologist, Professor Salim Abdul Karim. So, Professor, you received your first message uh, about the COVID virus while uh, you were on a vacation with your family, but you didn't think that it was going to be so deadly at the time. When did you realize that this was serious? You know, once a year, we try to go away as a family on a vacation. That's my three children, my wife and I. And in 2019, we decided to go to the Drakensberg Mountains. And so we were, you know, hiking on a trail and I got the first announcement. It was a ProMed alert and it was on my iWatch. And as I was, you know, walking up in the mountains, and uh, when I first saw it, I didn't even give it a second thought. I stopped on the trail. I read it. It said undiagnosed pneumonia uh, in Wuhan, China. And I just ignored it because I thought, ah, what can it be? You know, I, if it was Ebola or something like that, I would have taken a little bit more serious note of it. So when I came back to work, it was, I think it was the 11th of January, that my colleague, Professor D'Olivera, came up to see me. His office is one floor below mine. And he came on his cell phone. He said to me, have you seen it? It's on Twitter. I said, what are you talking about? And he says, it's the sequence of the virus. I said, what? <laughs> it's only, you know, this, since the alert, it's only been you know, not even two weeks how can they have the sequence of the virus? And they wouldn't put, put it on Twitter. They would put it in a major journal. Um, so it can't be true. He says, no, it's genuine. It's from Eddie Holmes. It's true. Have a look at it. So I, we looked at it together, and that's when I realized we were dealing with something different, something that was not uh, a virus we were familiar with. And so that was the first real wake-up call for me. But I was still in a bit of denial. Uh, I have to say that I wasn't really ready to acknowledge this was going to be a big problem. But it, by the end of January, when the WHO declared a public health emergency, by that stage, it was abundantly clear. But even before then, I think that the papers that came out of Wuhan, China, started raising the alarm bells for me. And I think when um, the China CDC made the announcement that they had clear evidence of person-to-person -person spread, uh, that pretty much said it all. And so it was by late January or sometime second half of January that I had to come out of my denial and, you know, get with it and take it on. So that's when it happened. Mm. And now let's talk about the title of your book, uh, which uh, for me is unapologetic, that you are backing science. Why do you think, Professor, that there were many people uh, who do not have the same trust in science or in the COVID vaccine? You know, I mean... Uh dealing with epidemics and pandemics for nearly 40 years. I did my first epidemic investigation in about 1984-85 uh, of measles. So I've been in this business a long time. I mean, I chaired our government's polio expert committee. I've been in many ways studying pandemics and so on. So it's not new to me that you know, you would get people who take a different perspective when they look at a pandemic. It became most acute to me during the HIV pandemic. In HIV, there were a group of people who believed that the virus was created by the Americans and that it was spread through a polio vaccine. And there's a book even written about it called The River. And famously, you know, we even had a president who didn't believe that HIV uh, caused AIDS. So 
the science has been challenged in the midst of pandemics long before COVID. COVID is not the first time. What happened in COVID, however, was different. And it was different principally because something changed. And that change was that COVID-19 was the first pandemic in the history of the world where we were now in the midst of a situation where social media became a major form of transmitting information. So until then, how would you know about something? Well, the newspapers would write about it. The radio and television would cover it. So it was covered by professional journalists who you know, would submit it to their sub-editors and then to their editors. So it goes through a process where it's checked. And so most of what you see in regular media has been checked, and you know it's accurate, so you can rely on it. And that's why when people read the newspaper or listen to the television news, they have a sense that they can rely on it. In social media, none of those rules apply. You can write any kind of nonsense. I mean, you can write the most blatant untruths and people receive it. And what is weird to me is that people believe it. I, that that's strange to me because I'm I'm a skeptic. I, 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 that's why I'm a scientist. I'm a skeptic. But when people received nonsense and they think it's real, and worse that they even spread it, that for me became a whole new challenge. That misinformation became uh, a way in which information was now being put out there. Now, it must be made very clear that misinformation and disinformation is not occurring by accident. In other words, it's not some person who just mistakenly is saying something that's not true. It is a deliberate effort to muddy the waters, to confuse people, and to change the narrative. So that's what this is. And the best study I have seen was an article I read in the New York Times about a study in the US where they looked at Twitter and Facebook, and they looked at it over several months. And what they found is that 12 individuals accounted for the vast majority of the disinformation. And of these 12 people, two of them dominated it. The first was an osteopath, so not even a real doctor. And the second is Robert Kennedy, who was not a doctor at all. So you got people who have no understanding of science, who have no knowledge on the subject, just like President Becky has no knowledge about virology, has no knowledge about how diseases are caused and how viruses regularly cause syndromes, makes a, you know, a completely ignorant statements that a virus cannot cause a syndrome. When viruses routinely cause syndromes. So you got individuals who deliberately spread disinformation. Now, this disinformation, when, it, when people are receiving it, they are receiving it, and sometimes it, it touches on something they really want. And here's where science doesn't help. When people are being put into a situation where they are anxious, when people are put into a situation where they are worried they're going to die. And that's what COVID at the beginning was. People are anxious and they're worried and depressed and so on. They want to know who is doing this to me? Who is causing my problem? They need to direct their anger against somebody. And 
When you ask a scientist, the scientist says, no, we don't know that answer. But let me tell you, this is the virus. You can't see it. But this is the one that causes the disease. This is what happens. So we don't give them somebody to blame. But when you read the disinformation, the central thing that disinformation does, it tells you somebody is making this problem. And it tells you who is to blame, and it tells you who to get angry with. And the more powerful that person, the better. So I became a target that I'm the one that's causing this problem. But mostly, Bill Gates. Why Bill Gates? Because he's a powerful person. He can do this, and it's, it's believable. When somebody says, you know, Elon Musk is doing this to you. You believe it because the man is powerful. He can do things. And Bill Gates is the same. He's powerful. He's got money. He's got resources. So that's why the disinformation gets spread so rapidly because people want to know that information and, and they believe it as a result. And now, Professor, can you briefly talk us through your thoughts uh, on the fact that uh, Africa battled uh, to receive vaccine compared to the developed countries? So that became a major issue in this pandemic, and I've written extensively on it. I've published several papers on the subject. And I didn't really grasp the problem at the beginning. And the reason is that in every epidemic and pandemic in the history of the world, we have never had a vaccine while the pandemic was still present. Never. It's never been. We've never had an Ebola vaccine. We've never had a SARS vaccine. We've never had uh, 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 a flu vaccine for the virus that's causing the flu. We've never had that. The vaccines always come afterwards because vaccines take a long time to make. So we've never had a vaccine before during the pandemic. So this issue of vaccine inequity in the midst of a pandemic is the first time we've ever experienced it because the first time we actually had a vaccine in the middle of the pandemic. And it became clear to me that because the vaccines were being made by private drug companies, they were the ones who are calling the shots. So the decisions about who gets a vaccine and who doesn't get a vaccine, that decision is being made by drug company executives who principally are trying to protect their markets. So if you are a good market for a drug company, then they will give you favorable terms. If you are not a good market for them, why would they want to give you the vaccines? They would much rather give it to countries that are good marketplaces for them. So if they give it to you, they want to charge you more. They want to punish you because you're not, because they are being driven by their need to make money from the vaccines, but also from their other products. So South Africa was always at a disadvantage. We were at a disadvantage because we don't make our own vaccines. We were at a disadvantage because we were going out there with our begging bowl and saying, oh, please give us vaccines, please give us vaccines, because we were not a primary a drug market that the drug companies came to us. We went to them asking them for these vaccines. So we were always in a disadvantage and we paid the price for it. But South Africa had one option, which was to be part of COVAX. And COVAX was the mechanism created to create global equity in vaccines. The problem was that COVAX failed. COVAX failed us. It failed the world because, like all of us, COVAX was not a preferred market for the drug companies. 
So COVAX got its vaccines very late. In fact, by the time COVAX got vaccines, more you know, many other countries had already secured vaccines. Mm. So COVAX was just too late. But South Africa also didn't play its part in COVAX to the extent that we agreed that we should be part of COVAX up front. There's a MAC advisory on that saying and telling the government that it should be part of COVAX. But the government went into COVAX, but then didn't pay. It didn't pay. It missed deadline after deadline after deadline. It eventually paid late. And because it paid late, it went to the back of the queue in COVAX. So in many ways, what our government was doing is that it wasn't a preferred marketplace for the drug companies, but it was trying to buy these vaccines from them. It was delayed in paying COVAX, so it was at the back of the queue with COVAX. And so that's the reason why we were not getting vaccines when many other countries were. I mean, we were among those that got vaccines early compared to many other countries, but we were not in that first group. In Africa, actually, Morocco and Egypt got vaccines first and the Seychelles, but they got vaccines through vaccine diplomacy. So they didn't get those vaccines from drug companies. They got it from governments. In the case of uh, uh, most of those countries, they got it from the Chinese government. So the Chinese government was giving these vaccines out to countries that it had as preferred countries of its own. And we didn't qualify in that for that. But now, Professor, tell us about the role of lockdowns uh, in protecting uh, South Africans from the COVID pandemic. Do you think it was necessary? So, you know, I, I've been involved in public health for many years, and I co-edited one of the public health textbooks. Nowhere had I heard of the word lockdown. It's not in our textbook. It's not in public health textbooks. It's not a known public health strategy. It's a military strategy. It's a police strategy. When the police talk about, we're going to lock this down, it's usually because somebody's been murdered or something, and they want to contain the murderer. They want to know the murderer's in this area. We're going to lock it down so we'll catch the murderer. Right? So that's, that's the traditional way you think about lockdowns. It's not being used widely in public health circles. So I was not familiar with it. I first heard about it when the Chinese instituted it. Uh, they instituted it in Wuhan. And initially, I didn't know what it really meant and how to do it or what it could do. But the WHO sent a team to China to go and learn what the Chinese did to contain the Wuhan epidemic. And so that team, which was led by a very eminent scientist called Bruce Elwood, they published a report. And that report came out in March of 2020. And that report provided the first evidence to show that the lockdowns actually worked. They, they, they were, the lockdown was able to slow the virus in Wuhan, China. So the amount of new infections slowed down quite drastically. Now, the way the Chinese do lockdowns is not, it's not easy for others to follow them because when they lock down, they lock down. You stay at home and they have a system where you can phone in for food and so they had teams of people who were going and distributing food, whether it was cooked food or uncooked food. Uh, if you needed medical care, they had this red flag system in Wuhan. So I read about how Wuhan did lockdown. And it became very clear that when you look at all of the, the tools we had available, the lockdown was the one that we had some evidence it worked because there was no evidence at that time that masks were. 
So most countries and the WHO hadn't even recommended masks. So we didn't really have much else. The only things we had at that stage were social distancing and lockdowns is a, is a form of social distancing and uh, washing of hands and, and that hand sanitizing. That was it. We didn't really have much else. And so we instituted the lockdown, even though I had nothing to do with it. You know, there was no ministerial advisory committee at the time. We were, in fact, were created the day the president announced the lockdown. But it became clearer to me with time that the lockdown was actually necessary and at the time was the right thing to do. I was a bit surprised that the president and our government instituted the lockdown. I, I'm so used to the fact that our government doesn't really do well in pandemics, you know, because previously in the AIDS pandemic, they made a mess of it. So nobody was questioning whether this virus caused COVID-19 or anything, they just acted. And that, for me, was a very positive sign. It's a sign of leadership making difficult decisions and making them timelessly when they can make a difference. So I was overall very pleased that our government was able to take those steps. But we didn't really know if it was going to work. But what we were hoping to achieve, would it flatten the curve? And it turned out, yes, it did flatten the curve. Subsequently, the Royal Society, which is you know, one of the most prestigious societies for scientists, uh, released a report. And I was part of that report. But in that report, they looked at all of the evidence, all of the papers that have been published on lockdowns. They looked at nine NPIs, masks, social distancing, closing of borders, and, uh, quarantines, and so on, all of that. They looked at lockdowns as one of them. And they show quite clearly and quite conclusively that lockdowns are actually very effective in slowing down the virus. So we now know as a fact, based on this accumulated evidence, that yes, lockdowns were. So we need to keep it in mind, not, not necessarily that we'll use it again, but it is an option in that it is effective if we need to use it again. There was Professor Salim Abdul Karim speaking to Krima Media's Polity, discussing his book titled Standing Up for Science, A Voice of Reason.